So uh, that was just a, a Glennism. Yeah, no, I think you're right. And I, I, I think there are many times when God doesn't heal us um, or chooses not to. Can you think of any examples of that? This is not one of the questions in the thing, but can you think of any examples of when in Scripture God didn't heal? Paul, thrown in the flesh. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And how is that different? I mean, did God not, or did, didn't Christ give the apostles at times the power to heal? Yes, correct. So what do you think happened late in Paul's life when he couldn't heal, be well, healed? We are cessationists by belief that the... the the miracle signs and wonders that were given to the apostles were meant hey, Joe. Uh, solely to affirm or confirm the message or the authenticate the message of the messenger. Then, as things were winding down, you couldn't, you know what I mean? They couldn't heal. That's why Paul wrote to Timothy, take some wine for your stomach's sake. But at the same time, at the end of Acts, when he gets bit by the viper... Um, he doesn't die because that was evidence to the to the group around him. So you see this intermediate balance of the sign gifts wearing off. Yeah, I, the scripture was being completed. Yeah, scripture was being completed. I, I do think it's interesting uh, to note that it wasn't just when he prayed the three times for the thorn of the flesh, but there's evidence all through Paul's writings of moments when he acknowledged. His uh, issues, his struggles, his um, disabilities, and yet didn't find any healing. Yeah. Um, See how large my handwriting is. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. And, and I, I'm, I'm finishing this book for, you know, in my own hand. Yeah, that's right. Right. So his secretary was on vacation or something right. at that point. But One thing we've got to remember is God built our bodies to heal themselves. All right? And we can use different things, different chemicals of things that we use mm-hmm. to bring restoration. Now, is that healing? I don't know. But, I mean, that's that's not it's, that's not what definition of you're using for healing here. Sure. Do you think that God's healing is different for his people than it is for people that are outside the family of God? Mm-hmm. Say that again? Do you think that God's healing for his people, children of God, are different, is different than his healing for people that are outside of the family of God? I don't think so. No, I don't think so. Just because Ecclesiastes, everything under the sun, you know, sun shines and rains on the wicked and the righteous. He has his purposes in healing. Mm -hmm. We can't guarantee, we can't look and discover what they all are. We don't know who's who's supposed to be healed and who isn't. It's it's not up to us. We don't well, want to limit what it is that yeah. God's deciding to you do. You also have the book of Romans, chapter 8, where I think it says that all things work together for good yeah, and really. are called according to his purpose mm-hmm. to make us more like Jesus Christ. So if you're looking at healing as a completeness, as we're looking at the good and the bad, we're being molded to his son. So even the unsaved might be being drawn to God through the, the, the trouble. Mm-hmm. Or the having, healing from it. Right. Or the healing from it. You can say that Romans even confirms that God uses that pressure cooker to mold us like his son. Hmm. I, I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. No, you're right. Do you think in the Ten Commandments when he says visiting the iniquities of the father unto the third and fourth generation, that that would be uh, like bad genes or also uh, inherited uh, sickness? I don't think we need to. I, I, I don't think I'm, I'd be comfortable defining yeah. what what the, that kind of proclamation or curse would be. Um, it was it was an issue of disobedience and certainly a judgment of God. However, he executed it. Um, I don't know. Learn behaviors, um, train up a child kind of behaviors, you know, whatever you fed them emotionally as you wrote, raised them is, is what they're going to reproduce. And their children, you know what I mean? I don't want to get into, you know, was it physical? Was it spiritual? Was it emotional, mental? I, it might have well, been all of those things. physical effect. 
Well, it has a physical okay. effect for sure. So, but I can't say I can't say that it would affect you know that God somehow twisted your genes or something for three three generations. No, no, but, not that God twisted your genes. Just that the way you're raised, the way you believe, the way you are. Uh, right. You, you exactly. Fall, you fall into a different kinds of sins than other people would. Uh, different kinds of sicknesses that other people would. Makes you apt to do that for right. sure, but. It, uh, again, the passage that you're talking about is, is very distinct for the nation. with evil or puts evil on it. Right, exactly. I think it's more along the lines of a reap what you sow as opposed to, uh, you know, pinpointing, you know, any kind of, like you were saying, like, you know, the emotional, the mind, the genetics. Well, we got to remember, too, um, especially that passage that you quoted there, that that's, that was very specific with the nation of Israel. It may be, a, it may be able to be applied more generally. Um, but it was for the nation of Israel because of their disobedience, it was God's judgment um, on them, um, and that those sins in particular were going to return to them for three to four generations, and that was just his declaration um, going on there. But I think you're all right. I think, I think the bottom line is that God chooses to do whatever he does with whoever he chooses to do it. Uh, just because he does heal at times doesn't mean he will heal or ought to have healed from our perspective uh, we look at it humanly speaking and with finite minds, and we don't understand fully what God is doing. Let's look at number three there. Um, read Psalms 34, 17 through 22. So let's look at Psalm 34, um, starting verse 17. Now, the righteous cry out, and the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. The Lord is near to those who have a broken heart and saves such as have a contrite spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. He guards all his bones, not one of them is broken. Evil shall slay the wicked, and those who hate the righteous shall be condemned. The Lord redeems the soul of his servants, mm. and none of those who trust in him shall be condemned. Uh, there's a psalm of David um, when he pretended uh, madness before Abimelech, uh, who drove him away, and then he departed. Uh, so he's really celebrating God's preservation or God's kind of um, leading him to do what he did to preserve him through a situation that was dire. Um, and God did that um, willfully and skillfully, and away uh, David went from that situation. Um, make a list for me. Just take a minute and make a list of all the things these verses say God is or does, and then next to those things about who he is and what he has done, uh, who it was that he did them or was that for. You know what I mean? Make a list of all the things that he is or did, and then who he was or did them for. Now there's going to be some awkward silence on the stream because they're all doing their homework. So we're making a list, number three. Um, by the way, if, if any of you are watching along uh, in your church app, you're able to go to the uh, Bible study section there in the menu, uh, pull that down, and in the Bible studies, uh, you can click on today's Bible study, Healing for His People, and you should be able to follow along. We're on number three there. Read Psalms 34, 17 through 22, and make a list of all the things these verses say God is or does, and who he is or does them for. So everybody's working on that. Probably come across as awkward silence there, but I'm listening to them chewing their gum and <laughs> breathing and sighing, and it's, it's all going good. Am I chewing that loud? Uh, no, 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 the writing's not that loud either, but I, <laughs> I just glory in the fact that at my age I still hear it. So <laughs> I'm happy with that. I know my Bible there. That's driving me nuts.
Okay, rather than going through every one of these, choose one. Where do you find yourself most, or which one of those do you most identify with and why? Of all those things that God says he either is or does, for the people he says he is or does them for, which ones do you most closely identify with? The liberal. Mm-hmm. And why? Because I'm always in trouble. <laughs> The righteous cry out, and the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. Okay? Many are the afflictions of the righteous. <laughs> Many are the afflictions of the righteous. Talk to me a little bit about that. I, how do you guys feel about that statement? <clears throat> true. It's true? <laughs> yeah. And, and based on what do you say that? That Basically, it's true? Basically, what would you, Miss Edie just said, that, uh, you know, uh, we... We're called according to his purpose, and he has a purpose in our afflictions, and uh, specifically mm-hmm. so here for the righteous, and not our own righteousness, because of Christ's righteousness. Okay. It's not permanent. He delivers me out of it. Okay. Not only is it all-inclusive, all inclusive, all of our troubles, um, but... Paul emphasizing the, the idea that he delivers us from them. They're not permanent. Uh, it's all inclusive, but it's not forever. Um, I think that's interesting. Good. Any others? Which one do you identify with most? Anybody else have a different one? It's like the Lord is near to the brokenhearted, mm-hmm. and he saves the crushed spirit. Hmm. Uh, interesting that the Lord is near... If you have a broken heart, yeah. Yeah. when you're when you're really ba- down, that's when God's beatitude yes. comes in and comforts you. Right. What a what a precious promise that is. That we are we are never far from God, or the other way around. He's never far from us, and especially when we find ourselves in a place when we are broken hearted, God is with us. And the beautiful part is um, that um, he saves such as has a crushed spirit. He's not only nearby us, but in his compassion and his desire, he desires to bring healing to that spirit that's crushed. That's beautiful. Any other thoughts? Down here on 22. Mm -hmm. He redeems his servants, and when we take refuge in him, he won't condemn us. No condemnation. Can you think of a New Testament verse that talks about that? There is, Romans 8, there is therefore now no condemnation to them who are called, who are in Christ Jesus, who walk after walk after the Spirit, not after the flesh. There we go. Romans, Romans 8, 1, there is no condemnation. We forget that's not just a New Testament promise. For those even in the Old Testament who put their trust in God, there's no condemnation. Isn't that interesting? Because Israel didn't, Israel didn't think in those terms, typically. Uh, they, they had the sacrifice, which constantly appeased the wrath of God, but never thought in the terms of full salvation, full rescue from it. Uh, not until Christ. And... Uh, so I think that's kind of uh, that's kind of interesting. If you had to summarize one main theme in these verses, if you had to boil it all down to one theme in this group of verses, what would that theme be? Summarize. God is sovereign. Okay. God is sovereign. God is loving. God is loving. He is near. He is near. Yeah. I picture with his arms around me. Yeah, absolutely. That day is coming for sure. Yeah. You think it's the covenant-keeping God? Um, he doesn't let his people go. As a covenant-keeping God, he won't let his people go. Any other thoughts? Not only does he do all of those things, and all of those things are true, But do you notice that all of those things are God reaching out to bring us out of the hurt? 
I mean, notice the words. Um, rescue, saved, um, healing. Um, what are the other ones? Delivers, redeems, and no condemnation. All of them talk about the fact that God wants to resolve our affliction, at least spiritually, and somewhat even more than just spiritually in this passage. God is, God is a healer of his people um, all the way through here. What can be learned from verse 19? We may have alluded to this a little bit. What can be learned from verse 19? He's not partial. He delivers all of them. He's not partial. He delivers all. He's able to deliver. And like Glenn said, uh, many of the afflictions. We sometimes go through life thinking that... Um, Somehow, if we're saved, we shouldn't have a bucket full. Uh, and sometimes God allows a shovel full, a wheelbarrow full, or a truckload full. Um, some of the great saints of old uh, went through tremendous hardship. Um, C.H. Spurgeon suffered with terrible depression. One of, the, one of my favorite authors that I've read. Um, and God saved. I mean, you talk about the Billy Graham era through C.H. Spurgeon, probably even to this day, countless hundreds of thousands of people have come to know Christ as Savior because of his ministry. Uh, he suffered terribly, bucket loads of, of uh, issues, emotional issues, aside from uh, physical struggles and things. Yet, um, God seems to want to rescue us from all of them. And they're going to be there, but it's, it's, it's according to his timing, not according to ours. All of these are true for Christ, where it says, not a one of his bones will be broken. He was the only righteous one. Yeah, the truth seems to shift a little bit, or not the truth, but the, the focus seems to shift a little bit from David and God's chosen people to the Christ himself. Okay. Yep, yep, Absolutely. Um, let's look at Psalm 147, verse 3. Turn there or click there if you want. Psalm 147, verse 3. You guys just figured it out? No. Oh. Right in the app you can click it. And it comes up. Yeah. 147, verse 3. He, God, heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. Have you ever seen God prove the truth in this verse? Mm -hmm. To you? Mm -hmm. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. This psalm is a little bit different because it's not, it's not written, or at least it's not couched in a specific event. Um by the, the title of it. Uh, it's more of a general truth. Uh, the, in, the, the, the verses before, praise the Lord, for it is good to sing praises to our God, for it is pleasant and praise is beautiful. The Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers together the outcasts of Israel. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. He counts the number of the stars. He calls them all by name. Great is our Lord and mighty in power. His understanding is infinite. The Lord lifts up the humble. Uh, beautiful verses. Describe one time when you saw God prove this to you. Can you think of an example of a time that you saw God prove this to you? That he heals the brokenhearted, binds wounds. I have to say in part... Um, with the difficulty of, uh, you know, losing my dad, how Mary's resolve in the Lord, you know, and the trials with the hurricane, and just, we're just watching this amazing woman 
come out of this. You know what I mean? She three years ago she couldn't balance a checkbook, and now she's balancing contractors and this mold remediation, and it's just really it's part of the healing process. I mean, it doesn't mm. fill in any of the gap of dad or the longing or the loss, but. It is a blessing to just see him work through hmm. uh, through her in this uh, really unique time. Is there any? Uh, does anything stand out to you about the thought of him binding wounds? Heals the brokenhearted is pretty adamant. Pretty all of a sudden. Is binding the wounds different? Yes. It takes time. It takes time. He's preparing that which has wounded us so that we might have time to heal. But he's giving us time to heal. It's not, God doesn't always instantaneously bring healing. Um, sometimes he does, and sometimes he just binds the wounds and uh, allows us to go through the time of healing, uh, whatever that time might be. Um, verses 4 through 6, do these verses deepen the truth found in verse 3 for you? And if so, how? Verses 4 through 6, do these verses deepen the truth found in verse 3 for you? And if so, how? I don't, I don't think anybody has ever counted all the stars. Only God. Only God. Mm -hmm. There's more stars up there than anybody can count. Mm -hmm. I have to think again with Paul and his storm in the flesh that he had prayed the three times and and the trials that I'm going through, and it is very humbling. Mm -hmm. And it's just how the Lord uses the trials to bring about humility. Mm -hmm. Um, in verse 5, it says there's no limit, and yet he's going to help you meet us, you know? Like, <laughs> mm. he's there to bind up our wounds and heal our hearts. And... Yeah, it's interesting to consider that the God who is healing the brokenhearted and binding our wounds is the God who is without limit. Mm. He can and is able and will. Because he's promised that he will. Um, and I think that is interesting um, when you consider all of those things. And, and then verse 5 emphasizes that. Great is our Lord, mighty in power, an infinite understanding. What does that imply in the midst of our hurt and our in need of healing and our broken heart? He knows what we're going through. He understands yeah. everything. There's nothing I face, nothing I walk through that he isn't intimately participating and experiencing together with me. Um, through the person of Jesus Christ, he experienced that um, as Christ went through that. Um, and then at the end of verse 6, uh, the Lord lifts up the humble. God is going to lift us up. Uh, and I think that's, uh, that's an interesting promise. Let's, let's turn to Romans 8. Strange that uh, Jane should have brought that up. Romans 8. Nah, I know, you know. I think she, maybe she looked ahead. Eight verses 15 and 16, one of the strangest. <laughs> Romans eight fifteen and 16. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear. But you were, uh, 15 and 16. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. What seems to be the weapon God has given us here in these verses for us to use to battle fear? Okay? The Spirit? <clears throat> Joe says adoption, okay? Well, adoption comes by the Spirit, so obviously we wouldn't be able to do it without the Spirit, but I do think it's the adoption that he's given us. Mm -hmm. um, 
the very weapon that we have to battle fear is the knowledge that we've been adopted into the family of God after looking at how the Bible describes who God is. That's my predestination verse, Ephesians 1 5. Yeah. Look it up and give it to us or say it. All right. Uh, Ephesians 1 5. And declared with power to be, and declared with power the Son of God and called us the sons of adoption. Maybe I'll look it up. Okay. Sorry. That's okay. Because you're right. Ephesians, Ephesians all through talks about the blessings of the adoption being, um, being adopted. Right, having, right. having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. Okay. So the weapon that God gives us here in Romans 8 is described as being given by the Spirit. Um, and it is adoption into the family of God, and the very adoption into the family of God is a very weapon God gives us to combat fear. We were not meant, once adopted, to remain in the bondage of fear. Isn't that an interesting thought? God does not intend us to remain in the bondage of fear. Then I'm a mess. We all are. Because I think... We're still finite in our understanding of that. We're finite in our understanding of what God has given us through the adoption. Finite in our understanding of the expanse of his power, um, the, um, the strength of the resource that he's given us and who he is, uh, the, strength, the strengthening power of obedience and resolve and resolute um, decisions as far as what God desires for us. That's why John writes in 1 John chapter 3, right? We're not what we should be, but we will be what we shall be when we see him, Christ, fully. Mm -hmm. Once we see the full revealed Christ, and implied with that is, is, a, is a more clear vision of who Christ is than we've ever seen um, in, in our life, because now we're standing before him. And a clear understanding of who Christ is simply automatically at that moment just makes us like him so we feel fear and sometimes feel we're in the bondage to fear but it's only because we fall short in our finite understanding of who God is in the first place and what he has done for us through his adoption but it is the adoption itself that gives us everything we need to combat fear we just learn and grow in our ability to access it and to trust it and to use it and apply it in our lives. Um, how is fear described in verse 15? Slavery. What's that? Slavery. Slavery, bondage, bondage yeah. mm. entrapment, stuck, trapped. That's a pretty powerful thing. Uh, it's powerful for us to be able to walk out of it's emotionally powerful for us to ignore, um, and it is easily distracting to our trust. Easily distracting to our trust, humanly speaking. So we are dependent upon God. How do these verses make you feel, these two verses, and why? How do these verses make you feel, and why? Secure that God makes his children his children, and if you have love for your children, you're not going to let something bad happen to them. You're going to be with them and every time they fall or something, you okay. be there to comfort them. Secure as a child of God, knowing who God is. Good. Makes me feel guilty. Okay. Because if, if when, when, which seems to be a constant for me. That, for all of us, by the way. Right, exactly. <laughs> um, that it's just a a reflection of your mm -hmm. misunderstanding of God, you know? Mm -hmm. It's just really, it's a full frontal assault to just like, you're nervous and because you're not trusting. Mm -hmm. Okay. You're adopted no matter if you trust or not. So I think the spirit bear witness in who you are 
and how you act and what you say and do. Focus more on the good spirit side of the Holy Spirit that bears witness. That's the best testimony that you love and want God. Hmm. And I think as the Holy Spirit's working in your heart, you cry out, Abba, Father. <coughs> so that helps take away the guilt, Glenn. Yeah. As you are seeking him and you want him and your spirit wants to bear witness of him more good than bad. It's not that we're saved by work. Right. But kind of book of James again right. we had to try to do to show that we're Christians and not because we've been clean. It's well, the Holy Spirit working yeah, through absolutely. us. I'm not and, and, and to and take our mind back, no, you said it exactly right, okay. but to take our mind, <laughs> yeah, okay. to take our mind back to the book of James as well, um, we got to remember that um, when God tells us to do that and to put our trust in what he is doing in our lives and to, um, and to allow those things to perfect or strengthen our faith, when we fail or fall short in knowing how to do that, um, James tells us, let it, you know, um, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all men liberally and upbraideth not. That's specific, specifically directed to our guilt. Don't feel guilty. God's not going to berate you for having asked. And in fact, it's almost as if the assumption is we're going to fall short. We're not going to know how to do that. Simply just ask God and trust him in that. And we fall short even in trusting him with that at times, you know. Um, but the good news is that, that we don't have a reason to feel guilty anymore because we are a child and we are, we are in a position with God to be able to cry to him, Abba Father, uh, which is a very endearing cry of a child for, uh, out of trust for a father who's going to come and help them. Um, and that's a, beautiful, uh, that's a beautiful reminder. I think it's interesting, um, Edie brought up too about the, um, the Spirit bears witness as well. It's interesting that it says here in Romans, the Spirit bears witness with our spirit. So the more that we practice this, the more that we rest in this, the more that we count on this adoption and all that it provides for us, the more God's Spirit together with my spirit testifies that my faith is in the right thing. And that's exactly James chapter 1. God strengthens our faith. He's proving to us that our faith is in the right thing. Remember, um, you know, my brother and always would fall into various provings. Uh, and I've taught that before, uh, the importance of remembering that those provings are not just provings to other people, but that God uses those times and that process to prove to me my faith is real. And so the more that we trust in that, the more that we hold on to this adoption and recognize what God has provided as he has adopted us in the family of God through the blood of Jesus Christ, what he has provided is enough that he can redeem us even from the fear that we fear, feel. That was a tongue twister. Um, the more we trust in him. And when we don't trust in him enough, ask. And when we ask, know that buckets full of trials come. <laughs> It just it just keeps coming. When he says in James, count it all joy when you fall into different uh, temptations. Trials, yeah. Right. right. So when we're when things aren't going right, shouldn't we be happy about that? And not wine. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and say, not okay, wine thank or you. thank you. Let's go. Let's do something else. Yeah, not wine or because most of the time, most of the time, when we ask for prayer, we're asking for prayer for relief yeah. from the circumstance we're in, rather than prayer for God to clarify what He's trying to teach us through it. And honestly, everything that we go through, God is teaching us more His faithfulness, our dependency, His glory, our blessings, His standards and purity, our obedience. Don't we get kind of blinded to that when we want? Absolutely, oh, yeah. I think so. I think so. I think it falls into the murmuring camp. But James does go on to say, when people are sick, you know, ask for prayer. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails what much. So just to ask sick, for prayer for something is not wrong. Sick might not be a trial. Well, it might not be. But I think in context it is in, that, in the book. Yeah, in that context. Yeah. 
Yeah. So, but what I'm saying is there is a difference between asking for prayer and praying for relief from something and whining as well. I think you're right. I think if we're feeling sorry for ourselves and and allowing ourselves to drown in the sadness of what we're going through, as opposed to acknowledging to God that he is with us and that he has something to teach us, help us to learn it, um, I think that goes a long ways. Um, turn a, a number of pages over to 1 Peter chapter 5, 6, and 11 so we can wrap this up. Ephesians 5, or 1 Peter 5, 1 Peter 5, <laughs> 1 Peter 5, verses 6 through 11. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. What does that sound like? 1 Peter 3, right? 1 Peter 2 and 3, where when Christ was reviled, he reviled not, but surrendered himself to the one who judges rightly, right? Um, so therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom you may devour. Resist him, steadfast in faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. Everybody goes through it. Isn't that interesting? But may the God of all grace, who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus after you have suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle. I never paid attention to that last one. And settle you. To him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. What a great passage of Scripture. What do you think is involved in humbling oneself under the mighty hand of God? Let's make it quick. We'll get through these questions quick. What, what, do, you, what do you think it means to humble oneself under the mighty hand of God? Submit to his will and what's going on. Yeah, submit to his authority over everything you're experiencing. It's his choosing, his choice. He's sovereign. Good. Um, how does verse 7 impact the command in verse 6, the imperative in verse 6? How does verse 7 impact that? He has more care than our care. <laughs> he cares for us more than our cares are, are yeah. said about. You could say God cares more for you than you care for yourself. Yes. Because he will do whatever you need. You do a lot simply because you want. God does everything for you based on what he needs. And he cares for you. How much easier is it for me if I'm focused on the fact that God loves me and cares for me, how much easier is it for me to submit or humble myself under his mighty hand, his authority? Because he cares. You know, it's, it's a lot easier to work for a boss who cares for you, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Bottom line, it's very hard to work for a boss who doesn't care for you. God cares for you, and that deepens that feeling. What are we supposed to use for resisting the one who seeks to devour us? Verses 8 and 9. What is it we should we use? Our faith. Okay. Our faith in God. We're to resist him through faith. We resist the one who wants to devour us in our hardship just through our faith. Isn't it interesting? It doesn't, it doesn't talk about focusing on him, outsmarting him, outdoing him, ignoring him. It has more to do with my focus on God and my faith in who God is and the fact that he does care for me and that I should be submitted under his sovereign hand knowing that that is the very thing that keeps me from being devoured by Satan in the first place. I have found that the weaknesses that I discover in my body cause me to think more of how God's helping me to get through every day. Hmm. Because I have these problems of a body that hurts when you move it, Mm-hmm. You praise God when you're able to do something. Makes you recognize yes. how much more dependable God actually yes. is. Not just how much more dependent I am on him, but how much more faithful he is to me. Yeah. Verse 10, what seems to be presented as inevitable for those who have been called to eternal glory by Christ Jesus? What seems to be inevitable for those who have been called to eternal glory by Christ Jesus in verse 10? Suffering. Suffering. 
you after you have suffered a while. But may the God of all grace, who called us into his, in etern, into his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while. Um, we'll all suffer. Suffering is only for a time. Right? right? God has something more for us. How might the proclamation of verse 11 impact my understanding of the previous verses here in 1 Peter 5? To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. How might that proclamation impact my understanding of the previous verses? Because that's the whole reason we were created. Glorify God. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, we would all glorify God. If God is who we understand him to be from the pages of Scripture, <clears throat> and what he saves me from, heals me from, redeems me from, according to verse 10, or verse, verse 9 and verse 10, as he perfects me, establishes me, strengthens me, and settles me in life. And I think that's interesting. Mm -hmm. If all of those things are true about him, and all things are for his glory, then nothing that happens to me will in any way fall outside of God's glory. Well, that's a good thing. And my good. Yeah. Isn't that powerful? What kind of healing does God seem most interested in? Eternal. Eternal. He's spiritual. Spiritual. Yeah. yeah. But may the God of all grace, 1 Peter 5.10, who called you to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus after you have suffered a while, Perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. A.W. Tozer said in The Problem of Pain, but from our present point of view, it ought to be clear that the real problem is not why some people, why, why some humble, pious, believing people suffer, but why some don't. I think that's interesting to think about. Um, I like this next one too, same author, same book. Thus, the terrible necessity of tribulation is only too clear. God has had me for but 48 hours, temporary, in hardship and pain, and then only by dint of taking everything else away from me. Let him but sheath that sword for a moment, and I behave like a puppy when the hated bath is over. I shake myself as dry as I can and race off to reacquire my comfortable dirtiness. If not in the nearest manure hoop, heap, at least in the nearest flower bed. And that is why tribulations cannot cease until God either sees us remade or sees that our remaking is now complete. Problem of pain. Hardship will continue. Additional healing is vital and unavoidable part of the human existence and creation that is locked in its cursed state. May we agree, with or without healing, we pray and hope for that God's completing work in us will continue to carry us through them all to the inevitable end for the believer, the eternal presence basking in his eternal glory with the experienced curse removed as far from us as the east is from the west. Mm. What a beautiful promise. In the future... Eternity comes where no evil reigns. That's peace. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity we've